Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Inspire Church. And those of you who are joining us via YouTube or Facebook, we say welcome to you in your home or wherever you may happen to be tuning in today. What a great day to be together for worship. We thank those of you in the room who have joined us amid this bitterly cold weather that we're having. But uh, someday it will get warmer. Of that we can be sure. We're going to start with a song that incorporates two things, the name of Jesus and the passion that we live with, which is our theme today. If I could have those words up, I'm going to sing this first part, and you're going to sing it as soon as you get it. Jesus, you're my master and my king. Jesus, you're my Lord, my everything. Jesus your blood that made me clean hallelujah hallelujah come on let's sing it together jesus you're my master and my king jesus you're my lord my everything jesus it's your blood that made me clean hallelujah Ashamed of the cross, not ashamed of your word. From the highest mountain top to the lowest valley low, I shout your name until the whole world knows Jesus. You're my master and my king, Jesus. You're my Lord, my everything, Jesus. It's your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, you're my master and my king. Jesus, you're my Lord, my everything. Jesus, it's your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can I do but dance and shout? I have to let these praises out. I once was lost and though so bound, by your grace I have been found. And if this world can scream and shout, an earthly temporary thing, then I can give my loudest praise to thee, Jesus. You're my master and my king, Jesus. You're my Lord, my everything, Jesus. It's your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus, you're my master and my king, Jesus, you're my Lord, my everything, Jesus, it's your blood that made me clean, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We got another song. <laughs> oh, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your Yeah. 
Steve, I got you right here. My fault. At least you know it's live now, right? We're going to sing a part where I sing a line and you echo it back like this. Inspire Church. We're casual, we're contemporary, we are Bible-centered, and we are so thankful that you're with us today. We're going to have a great worship service today because who is here? You are here. You're here in the web room. You're here across the United States worshiping with us today. We're so thankful for that. Um, we're excited to see what God's going to do in our midst today as we worship and praise Him. I'm excited today. I have passion. That's our theme. I have passion for our worship time together today because we're, we get to share communion today. So uh, those of you that are here in the room, you've got your juice and your bread. Just a warning, if you've not used those cups before, they're really hard to open up, all right? I really recommend you open them up ahead of time and just set them down on the floor. For those of you that are worshiping with us online, this is a great opportunity just to get up and go into the kitchen get a piece of bread, get a cracker, get a cookie, whatever you want, uh, get some juice, get some liquid, bring it back, and later on after the message today, we will be sharing communion together. So I said I'm really excited about worship today because who is here? You're here. But I'm more excited about worship because Jesus is here. And it's for him that we do this. And that gave me a thought. We sing for Jesus. Did you ever stop to think of that, that worship is for Jesus? So I had this idea in my head. What if instead of me, it was Jesus standing here saying, this next song, would you sing for me? How would you sing if Jesus said that to you? Yeah, or maybe, maybe not better, but louder and with more passion. For those of you that are worshiping online, if Jesus walked in your door besides freaking out, and but if Jesus said to you, hey, uh, while I stand here, would you sing for me? How would you sing at home? Probably with a lot more passion, enthusiasm, and excitement. So our next song is called Christ Be Magnified. This is a song to Jesus, and I want to invite you to stand up and sing like he's here today. Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north and south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing from sea 
and sky from rivers to the mountain tops we'd hear cries be magnified oh christ be magnified let his praise arise christ be From the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody, and every human heart its native cry, then in one enraptured hymn. stand strong and worship you and if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true and if the cross brings transformation then I'll be crucified with you cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life and if I join you in your sufferings then I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still keep singing And my song will be the same Oh, Christ be magnified Let his praise arise Christ be magnified Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified. In me. When we walk with the Lord in the pride of His word, what a glory He sheds on. abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and A shadow can arise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh nor a tear can abide while we trust and go. Trust. 
We'll sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and Trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Jesus, um, it is by your grace that we are saved, and it's by your grace that we live. It's by your grace that we are uh, able to trust you more and more. It's a process. We're working on it, Lord. You know that. And it's really not something that we're going to accomplish to complete until that day we see you face to face. So, Lord, we just want to give you thanks today for bringing us through this past week. We want to give you thanks for bringing us to this moment in time where we can be in your presence, we can be together with one another and worship you to sing your praises, to let you know that we love you. Uh, Jesus, for every blessing that we receive this week, we just want to say thank you. You're incredible, you're good, you're gracious, you're wonderful. Uh, as we open the word, Jesus, help us today to develop a deeper passion for walking with you. We thank you for all that you're doing for us, all that you have done, and all that you will do. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.
Let me ask a question today. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Think about that for a second, all right? What floats your boat? What motivates you in life? What excites you? What encourages you? What keeps you moving forward? What are you passionate about? Um, I want you to take just a moment and I want you to think of three things in your life that you are passionate about. All right? Think about that for just a second. Three things that you're passionate about. I've already thought about it, obviously. Uh, three things I'm passionate about is glazed donuts, jelly filled donuts, and apple fritter donuts. Now, I'm just kidding you. I have other passions in my life. Uh, in reality, and just like last week we talked about purpose, you have different purposes in your life, various purposes. You probably also have many things that you're passionate about. Uh, but uh, passion is what motivates you. Passion is what pushes you forward. Passion is what keeps you going in life. It's, it's what excites you. And uh, today as we continue our series who lives with you. Uh, we're looking at three P's, purpose, passion, and uh, perspective. And the idea is if you want to walk with Jesus, because he said, come and follow me, and I believe most of us want to walk with Jesus, I believe that these three P's, if we invite them into our lives, if we begin living with purpose and living with passion and living with perspective, in all likelihood, we're going to have a powerful, there's another P, walk with Jesus. Today we're going to talk about passion. It is a powerful P, and it's a good thing to have in your life because passion propels your purpose. Passion propels your purpose. We talked about purpose last week and uh, what God's plan and purpose for you, but I got to tell you, if you don't have per or passion, your purpose is going nowhere. Purpose without passion is nothing more than a great idea. Your passion is what pushes you to make your purpose a reality. So we're going to talk about passion today and how it can have such a powerful influence on our lives. It's so powerful. One person said, if you can't figure out your purpose at least figure out your passion. For your passion just might lead you to your purpose. Your passion has the potential to lead you to discover your purpose. Let's take a look at God's Word today and see what it says about uh, passion. Uh, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul, a man who was very, very passionate about uh, his relationship with Jesus Christ, and we're going to see what it was, what it is that drove Paul, what it was that motivated him, what it was that uh, gave him his passion to pursue Jesus. Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 7. Paul says, uh, whatever gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, <clears throat> yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining 
to the resurrection from the dead. Passion. Passion. As we look at our passage today, the first thing that uh, our first takeaway about passion that we see is that the greater your goal, the greater your purpose, the greater your passion. The greater the goal that you're moving towards, the greater the purpose that you're trying to attain, the greater your passion will be. Paul's goal, his purpose, was found in verse 8. He says, that I may gain Christ. So for Paul, his entire goal of his life is to become like Jesus. That's what he's shooting for. That's a huge goal. It's a huge purpose. And because of that, Paul was a man of tremendous passion. Now, uh, the greater your goal, the greater your passion, the greater your purpose, the greater your passion. The opposite of that is just as true. The smaller your goal, the smaller your purpose, the smaller your passion will be. I'm going to go home after worship today. Now, I won't tell you what I'm going to watch on TV, the Ohio State Buckeyes, but um, <clears throat> probably... We're going to eat dinner when we get home. As a matter of fact, there's a pot roast in the oven right now. We're going to have pot roast. We're going to eat dinner. And maybe during the halftime of the football game or when the game is over, I'm going to do the dishes. Okay? And that's going to be a goal. It'll be a purpose. Now, is that a big goal? No. Come on. That's a small goal. So guess what my passion will be? for doing these dishes. It's going to be a small passion. If you snuck into my house and watched me do dishes tonight, you're probably not going to see me singing and dancing. Woohoo! I'm doing the dishes! Yes! Knocking those dishes out one by one. No. I don't mind doing the dishes, but i got to be honest with you, that's not a very big goal in my life. It doesn't really reflect my purpose. So my passion is going to be low. The greater your goal in life, the greater the purpose that you are pursuing, the greater will be your passion. The second takeaway that we get from Paul about passion is this. Passion motivates you to give up what's less for that which is greater. Did you get that? Passion motivates you to give up what's less for that which is greater. Paul's talking about his life. And in verse 8, he says, you know, I have uh, lost some things in my life because he was following Jesus. And in verse 8, Paul says, I consider them garbage. What do you do with garbage? You throw it out. Paul says there were things in his life that he lost, and he doesn't care because they were garbage. Now, the translation of that word garbage is actually a polite translation. In the Greek language, the word can literally mean dung. And that, my friends, is a polite translation for what that word can mean. What Paul says is that, I can't believe I'm going to say this in a sermon. Don't hate me. Don't fire me. Paul's passion allows him to take the pooper scooper out for the things in his life that hold him back from pursuing his purpose. We need to identify the dung in our lives, the garbage in our lives that keeps us from drawing closer to Jesus. See, the problem is, as we go through life, there are things that diminish our passion. I'm sure you know this already. There are things in our lives that lowers our passion. Let me share just a few things that I call 
passion killers. Passion killers. Husbands, we're not talking about your wife's sweatpants. Not that kind of passion. Passion killers. Number one is fatigue. Fatigue. And fatigue comes with uh, time. Uh, the longer we go, the more difficult it is to keep our passion high. Because passion ebbs and flows as we go through life. You're going to get tired. And that includes when you follow Jesus. Jesus said, come follow me. And the valid questions to ask him, well, how long am I supposed to follow you? And what's Jesus' answer? Just follow me. We follow Jesus until the day we die. And as we know, as we get older, it's harder to keep that passion going. Fatigue kills our passion. The second passion killer is constant criticism. Constant criticism. By the way, let me just tell you, if people aren't criticizing you, your goal is probably not big enough. If you're never getting any criticism in life, your purpose is not big enough. But constant criticism, living in a constantly negative environment, kills passion. Third, uh, passion killer is very similar, and that's conflict. When you find yourself in an environment, either in your family or at work or in the church, and by the way, I think that's what's been going on in our nation politically, we're in constant conflict, and it kills our passion. Another passion killer is an unclear purpose. If you have no purpose to live for, you will have no passion to live by. The final passion killer is an undernourished spirit. This is just the truth. It's hard to be passionate about Jesus when your spirit is empty. To use Paul's language, we need to take out the garbage in our lives. We need to take out the trash in order to preserve our passion. So let me just ask you right now, what trash is there in your life that you need to take out because it's killing your passion? What dung needs to go? Paul, talking about this stuff, this garbage, this dung, this trash that needs to go, he says, when I look at all of this stuff, I count it as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Paul says, man, when I look at, at, at the worth and the value in my life of knowing Jesus, anything that keeps me from that, I'm going to toss out. Why would he say that? Because he has passion. It's what motivates him forward. Our third takeaway on passion from Paul is this. Passion motivates you to identify with Jesus. Passion motivates you to identify with Jesus. Paul says, I want to be found in Christ. I want to be found in Jesus. That word found is means to identify with. What Paul was saying is that when people look at my life, I want them to see whom? Jesus. Are you guys with me? It feels like the heat's on in here. It's like, whoo. We're getting these, like, glazed-over looks. So everybody refocus here. I'm watching you. You watch me. Here we go. When people look at your life, do they see Jesus at all? 
if someone examined your life, would they see any evidence of Jesus? Paul says, I want to identify with Jesus. I want to, I want to know him. I want to be found in him is what Paul says. This is a crazy uh, illustration, but I, it helps me understand this. When people look at your life, do they see Jesus? How many of you have ever read those Where's Waldo books? Are we on common ground here? Well, you know, Where's Waldo? Okay. Where's Waldo? I love those books. Waldo's that guy in the red and white striped shirt and the red and white striped hat. And he's got glasses. And he looks the same in every book on every page. And the idea is this. Each page is a scenario, a different scenario. One might be uh, the beach. One might be a sporting event. One might be a scene from downtown. And on the beach at the sporting event downtown, in that book on those pages are hundreds and hundreds of people. But there's only one what? Waldo. And he looks the same every time. And Waldo is hidden in that picture. And the question is what? Where's Waldo? So you look for Waldo until you find him. There's Waldo. Now here's my crazy illustration. I can guarantee you I've never used this before. What if you looked at the book and changed the name to Where's Jesus? And instead of a picture of Jesus... It's a picture of you. So when people see you in the crowd, who are they seeing? Jesus. We'll call the book, Where's Jim? And when you find me in the crowd, the tall guy, really who you're seeing is Jesus. What if we were, as Paul said, found in Jesus? What if our identity was Jesus to the point when people looked at us, people would see Jesus? Our fourth takeaway is this. Passion motivates you to experience Jesus. Passion motivates you to experience Jesus. Paul says, I want to know Christ. And when Paul says, I want to know Christ, he's not talking about book knowledge. He's talking about knowing someone the way you know them when you live with them, when you experience experience them. I could give you my wife's bio. I could tell you where she was born and her education, her family situation, what she does for a job. I could give you all of that information and you would never know her until you've lived with her for 39 years. I've experienced my wife Paul says, I want to know Jesus. I want to experience him. As I identify with him, I want to begin to live with him. And the final passion takeaway is this. Passion motivates you to finish the race. Passion motivates you to finish the race. Paul says, I want to know the power of his death and the power of his resurrection. Paul was really big into finishing the race. And it wasn't enough for, for him to identify with Jesus. It wasn't enough to experience Jesus. He wanted to go all the way until he could experience his death and his resurrection. To me, it's Paul's way of saying, I want to live and finish my race 
until the day I meet Jesus face to face. In Philippians 3 and verse 12, listen to what Paul says. Not that I've already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal. I press on. That's passion. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet having taken hold of it. One thing I do, this is passion, forgetting what's behind, this is passion, straining towards what is ahead, this is passion, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul was passionate about his purpose to gain Jesus Christ. How is your passion today? When it comes to your walk with Jesus, is there a fire in your heart that's burning? Because let me tell you, it's just a fact of life. As we continue down that road, passion diminishes. I've been following Jesus for 50 years this year. In over 50 years, my passion has done this. So I just want to ask you today, how's your passion level? How on fire is your faith? Is there stuff in your life that's holding you back? Is there garbage? Is there dung that you need to consider, as Paul would say, loss for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ? When was the last time you were truly in love with Jesus? When was the last time you wept because Jesus loves you? When was the last time your heart burned with passion for Jesus? Today, we're celebrating communion together. And what I want to offer to you is an opportunity to rekindle the fire. I want to offer to you the opportunity as you take the bread and the cup today. I want to offer you the opportunity to recommit your life to following Jesus. I want to offer you the, the opportunity to reignite your passion, to fan the flames. I want to offer you the opportunity to reconnect with your Savior. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for the gift of passion. Lord, I hope we realize passion's not yelling and shouting. It's not about being all excited. But it's about that deep, burning commitment to follow Jesus, to walk with him wherever he leads us. God, I want to thank you this week for using this passage for deepening my passion. I needed this, Lord. Today, as we share the bread and the cup, I pray that it will be a time for those of us here in the web room and those of us who are worshiping online, I pray that this will be a holy moment where we recommit ourselves to walking with Jesus. God, deepen our passion so we may 
pursue your purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. going to sing a simple chorus as we prepare our time of communion. My only hope is you, Jesus. My only hope is you, Jesus. My only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night. My only hope is you sing my only hope. My only hope is you, Jesus. My only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. My only peace. My only peace is you, Jesus. My only peace is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only peace is you. My only joy, my only joy is you, Jesus. My only joy. that I need. All that I need is you, Jesus. All that I need is you. From early in the morning till late at night, all that I need is you, Jesus. All that I need The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he is betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this, this, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I'm confident that Jesus was pleased as we sang words of praise to him and and remembered him in communion. I hope you take seriously the invitation to recommit your life to Jesus. In my own life, I've found that necessary to do on occasion just to tell Jesus one more time, I'm still in this game, Lord. I'm still following you. That's a decision you can make at any time in your life between you and Jesus, just to recommit to following him, to walking with him. Now, as is our custom, would you please stand for the benediction with your eyes wide open. May the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit Be yours today and forevermore.